We would like to welcome you all to our Alexandria Eye Care Retina Academy. Today we are going to talk about diabetic macular edema classification and its treatment. Basically, diabetes imposes its effect on the retina in two broad entities, namely maculopathy and retinopathy. Macular edema is classified by the OCT into tractional and non-tractional macular edema. The non-tractional macular edema is further classified into central and the non-central macular edema, according to whether it affects the foveal contour or not. Regarding the tractional macular edema, it is commonly seen in the vitromacular traction syndromes, epiretinal membranes, and tractional retinal detachments. The tangential and, and the anthroposterior tractions distort the foveal anatomy. It is better treated through traction relaxation, mostly by vitrectomy. The center involving macular edema. We have some questions to tackle. First, how many injections do we give to naive diabetic macular edema patients? The second question is when to stop injecting those patients. The third question is when to re-inject the patient again. And finally, which drug do we inject for diabetic macular edema? According to a restore study, it is recommended to initially inject the patients until you get two consecutive visits of stable vision and a dry OCT. In other words, we keep injecting our patients until we get the maximum best corrected visual acuity on two consecutive visits. At this point, we can stop injecting our patient and follow the patient visual acuity on a monthly basis. If the patient complains of diminution of vision, or a reduction of the best corrected visual acuity is detected, a new OCT will be ordered. And if it shows that this reduction in the, in the best corrected visual acuity is due to the recurrence of macular edema, then we start to re-inject those patients again until we reach the maximum best corrected visual acuity on two consecutive visits with a dry OCT. Regarding the use of laser, the DRCR protocol I showed that the visual gain by the end of the second year is higher in the ranibizumab groups compared to the laser and the combined laser and steroid groups. Also, it was obvious that deferring laser until the sixth month of injection has a higher visual outcome compared to prompt laser. So, can we anticipate how many injections patients need in the first five years? The answer is yes, where the five-year results showed that in the first year, most of the patients required between eight and nine injections, and in the second year, from two to three injections, and in the third year, from one to two injections, with the last two years free of injections. So which drug do we inject? This question was answered by the DRCR protocol T, the first and the second year results, comparing Avastin, Lucentis, and Ilea regarding the final visual gain and the anatomical improvement of the macular edema. It showed that if the patient visual acuity is better than 2040, then there is no statistical difference between, between the three drugs, and any one of the three drugs can be injected. On the contrary, if the visual acuity was less than 2040, a statistical significant difference was found favoring the, the injection of ranibizumab or aflibercept over the bevacizumab regarding the visual gain and anatomical changes. In the first year, in the group with the visual acuity less than 2040, there was a statistical difference in the visual gain between ranibizumab and aflibercept, with the aflibercept giving a higher visual gain. However, this difference was abolished by the second year, and both drugs were found to give a statistically insignificant final visual gain. Around 6% of the cases show no response to previous injection protocol. 
There are some alternatives to be tried, however, there is no strong evidence to support any of them. Regarding laser application, it is recommended to be deferred to the 24th week and to be applied to the active leaking microaneurysm with a spot diameter of 50 microns and adjusting the power to get a minimal graying effect. The third type of macular edema is the non-central involving diabetic macular edema. There is no strong evidence-based guidance for this entity, and a few small-scale studies were found to show that focal laser, focal laser is associated with a stable visual acuity and a decrease in the leakage at the end of the first year. These findings were supported by another retrospective study, where treated group has a stable visual acuity at the 12 month compared to the drop of vision seen in the control group. Also, the treated group has a greater reduction in the central foveal thickness compared to the non-treated group. So, to sum up, an OCT is used to classify the type of macular edema, whether it is a tractional macular edema or a non-tractional macular edema. The tractional type is better referred to a vitroretinal consultant to relieve a traction through a vitrectomy. And the non-central involving diabetic macular edema is recommended to be treated by focal laser than observation. However, these are poor evidences and those patients can still be followed up just by observation. For the central involving macular edema, we inject on a monthly basis any of the three drugs if the visual acuity was better than 2040, and we prefer to inject ranibizumab or aflipercept according to protocol T if the visual acuity was less than 2040, and then we keep following the patient visual acutely on a monthly basis. More than 90% of our cases are responders uh, to the injection protocol and will have a moderate visual gain and a better anatomy. And we keep injecting those patients until we reach a stable vision on two consecutive visits and deferring laser to the six months if ever needed. For the minor group of non-responders, switching to another drug can give better effect. However, this is an expert level of evidence, which is the least evidence level. For those responding, we will follow the PRN or as needed protocol as the other responders. And for the non-responders, it was claimed that we can try injecting steroids in pseudofecix according to protocol B. However, this approach was experimented in the recent protocol U, which tried injecting steroids in, with ranibizumab in pseudofecic patients having persistent edema. Strikingly, protocol U showed no further gain in the visual acuity with the steroid injection, but there was an anatomical improvement only in OCT. Also, it showed that approximately 30% of patients become glucometers, so, steroids are not recommended in the management of diabetic macular edema. The second effect of diabetes is the retinopathy classified by fluorescein and geography into non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy and proliferative diabetic retinopathy. For the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, we follow the same protocol to treat retinopathy associated with macular edema. For the PDR, the standard of care was doing PRP according to the diabetic retinopathy study. However, five years ago, anti-VEGF injections were proposed to treat PDR through the DRCR protocol S. The two-year results showed that anti-VEGF injections have a better visual gain, less future vitrectomies, and better visual field compared to PRP. Nevertheless, five-year results showed no differences between both interventions regarding future vitrectomies and peripheral field loss, but the moderate visual gain were higher in the anti group if there was a concurrent diabetic macular edema. 
Finally, I would like to thank you all for your attention and please feel free to send us your comments, questions and feedback.